podcast. <laughs> okay, so uh, again, my name is Jennifer Dell. I'm a faculty member here at the School of Urban Studies and Planning, and along with my colleagues Rob Bertini and Chris Monsier, uh, we help co-organize this weekly Friday seminar series on transportation. So welcome um, everyone who have new, new faces today. Um, we do, in case you did not know, we do webcast these seminars, so you can watch them live uh, sitting at your desk or somewhere else. Um, and then we also archive the, um, all of the seminars on the web, so you can go and look. We have more than 100 seminars posted on our website. You can go back and watch. Because we do webcast them, that's why there's these mic that's why we're in this room, there's the cameras, and why there are microphones on most of the desks in front of you. So when you do ask questions at the end of the presentation, uh, please remember to use the microphone, hold the touch button, keep the red light lit as you're asking the question so the people watching on the web can hear the question. And we do uh, we do have people who watch on the web, so we're not just making you do this uh, to torture you or something. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce um, our speakers for today. We have Jay McRae and Darren Muldoon from CH2M Hill, hence the turnout from uh, colleagues from that company, um, who are going to be talking about a study that they've recently uh, done for ODOT on traffic impact analysis. And I will also note that Darren Muldoon is an alum of the MERP program here at PSU. We always love to have our alums come back and speak at the seminar. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. My name is Jay McRae, and I'm going to do the first half of the presentation, and Darren will do the second half. I uh, thought I might just uh, get a show of hands. How many uh, people have gone to home base before? A few. How about uh, like a Target or a Costco? Okay, we're starting to get everybody involved now. Um, and I'm sure that when you went, you were curious whether or not the traffic impact study was accurate or not. <laughs> Right? <laughs> well, maybe not. Um, that kind of gives you a thumbnail sketch of what our uh, research project was about. Um, I'm going to talk through the first half, and I'll get Darren up here to talk in a little bit. So uh, our project objectives were to develop a best practice um, methodology for doing traffic impact studies. Uh, we don't think that... Uh, the universe has the perfect solution yet for how to predict traffic, for how to assess what, what's really going to happen after a development occurs. But ODOT was real interested, along with their local government partners, to come up with something that, that was scalable for a variety of, of development projects. There are some that are more complex than others. It'd be nice to know what to pay attention to. Um, they were also interested that it would have applicability across the state. So that it wouldn't just be focused on city of Portland or city of Stanfield, Oregon. Uh, another objective was to provide guidance to reduce the chance of, of making bad decisions that would have an adverse impact to traffic operations and safety. So if you really miss on the forecast and you overbuild, that's one kind of bad decision. If you underbuild, then that's a different type of bad decision. So really, we're trying to eliminate those extremes and get at something that's reasonable. Um, so which, alt which variables make sense to pay the most attention to? That's something we we're hoping to find. And then uh, to provide really an educational tool uh, for practitioners. So we want to leave something, a body of knowledge behind that people can refer to, use, and uh, uh, learn as they go. So our project organization it really involved two sets of groups here. We've got a technical advisory committee that consisted of, uh, again, ODOT with their local partners. Mark Jorger was uh, our project manager uh, for the contract, and he convened the group. Uh, Tom Boyat was an uh, Area 5 planner with ODOT uh, based in Springfield. Dwayne Hofstetter from David Evans and Associate, um, and Gary McNeil, City of Eugene, Bill Morgan, Lane County, Doug Norville, ODOT, with the Transportation Planning and Analysis Unit. Um, I can't pronounce the next guy's name. Uh, and John Young from FHWA. My name's Jay McRae. I was the project manager. 
uh, our team consisted of uh, Lauren Bloomberg as the senior planner and Darren Muldoon. Uh, our research approach uh, is really premised on let's look at some case studies based on what we learn from looking at those case studies, then there's a number of things we'd want to do to follow up on our findings. One would be to talk to the people most intimate with those traffic impact analysis to make sure that we understand the context of what was the situation uh, when the traffic impact analysis was being done. And then several years later, after implementation, what's it like now? So that's the validation interviews that we conducted. And we did a trend analysis to try to figure out, you know, what are, what are the commonalities of these case studies? And then from that, uh, derive some research topics that we could actually explore uh, literature that had been done by others. Um, and also review existing traffic impact uh, analysis guidelines that are out there that are easily accessible on the web. And uh, again, come up with some other topics. If there are holes in those guidelines uh, that overlap, is, is there something uh, more that we can find in the existing literature? And then the um, do some additional analysis on what we found and then uh, put together a best practices uh, document that folks can look at and lean on and uh, uh, use as new developments crop up. So the case study selection criteria, kind of the first thing is we needed to qualify ourselves as not having a conflict of interest. So organizationally, individually, professionally, we needed, the, the investigation team needed some separation from each of the existing case studies. So we didn't look at anything that CH2M Hill was directly involved with. Um, so that's one qualifier. Uh, the other thing that we used was a set of criteria established by the Technical Advisory Committee. They, again, they wanted sites from all five of ODOT's regions. They wanted a variety of small to large developments. They wanted a, a variety of land use density, so rural or uh, uh, urban fringe, uh, to fully urban dense situations. And then uh, also wanted to look at having a variety of engineers that actually did the traffic impact study. So we weren't picking on any one individual traffic engineer. That really wouldn't be fair, would it? Uh, so one other factor is, you know, why we're doing this it has to do with developments in and around interchanges to try to understand that better. So they, they were interested in, in uh, sites near an interchange. Here is a long list of, of sites that we looked at, 12 of them. And you can see that the uh, project names on the left-hand column, the location, address, uh, who prepared the uh, traffic impact study, and then which jurisdiction had uh, oversight or approval authority for that uh, action. And so there's a variety. Again, we met the criteria with this 12 uh, list of 12 case studies. So for the technical elements of the evaluation, we looked at what the various inputs were to the, the impact study. Things like location and type of development, year of analysis, the horizon year, how far out they were going to be forecasting traffic. And then also uh, firm, as I mentioned, the facilities analyzed. So which facilities? Was it a state facility, uh, a local street, how many intersections, those kind of things. And then other developments going on in and around that particular site. So you can oftentimes have a site here, but there are influencing factors. If you build one type of development, perhaps it opens a floodgate to additional developments and you get kind of a synergistic effect of land use around. So that's one of the things we also took a look at and got the information primarily from the interviews. 
so then the analysis boiled down to looking at land use code selection, trip generation, uh, the analysis peak periods daily, uh, what was used, uh, seasonal adjustments, growth rates, saturation flows, uh, intersection traffic, turning movements, and intersection operations. So you get a sense for uh, the level of detail that we were looking at with the case studies. Here's a, just an example of one of the case studies we did look at. It's the Barger Crossing site in Eugene and uh, Beltline Highway in this area is a, a north-south um, system type facility, access controlled. Uh, Barger Drive is a uh, urban arterial and the, the dashed line outlines the Barger development. And this is obviously after the development occurred. So what did we learn about this particular site? There were 137,000 square feet of retail development. So it's primarily a retail development uh, uh, with stores for people to shop at. So the report concluded that the level of service would be acceptable for the road improvements. Uh, the developer was required to make local street improvements to the city system. Um, the site development after the fact was, was ended up being differently than what was forecasted in the report itself. Uh, for example, there was a BIMART proposed for the site that wasn't built, and then there was an oil change um, company and drive-through coffee shop that were added. So there was one that went away, two additional uses that were added. Uh, so some additional findings, the actual PM uh, peak trip generation uh, is 57% higher than predicted. The actual counts of three or four, three of four of the study intersections was 23% higher uh, or lower and fourth was 12% uh, higher. Uh, the interview with the uh, local jurisdiction, uh, they had concern about the PM peak, peak trip generation uh, being understated at the time. Um, here's a um, at, at the time of the at the time of the at the st of the study. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, this is a chart that shows qualitatively uh, what we found for each of these sites, and I put kind of a summary out at the uh, far end. You can read this from the back. Perfect, right? Uh, I think the important notes here, if if you look at the far right-hand column, it's this kind of a qualitative summary with a legend at the bottom where the A's it would indicate that, hey, that traffic impact study was accurate. It gets an A. Uh, B would be, well, it's accurate for some items and it's overly conservative for other items. Uh, that would be a B. A C is conservative in most all and then D would be they underestimated. And so that really is a failure condition for operations and perhaps safety as well. So you get a sense that there's several A's over there. Uh, there's C's, B's, and a few D's. So we really did get kind of a cross section um, in our case studies. Um, of the case studies overall, 10 of, of 12 actually had results mostly consistent in matching the TIA prediction. Three were accurate, three were a mix, four uh, conservative, and two failed. Here's uh, one lens to look through of these case studies. And this actually compares uh, trip generation both in the daily and peak hour of, of what the report forecasted and what actually occurred. And if you're above the line, then you underestimated. If you're below, you um, overestimated. Did I say that right, Darren? No. <clears throat> I'm exactly backwards. <laughs> so the over, um, this one, the, the traffic actually ended up higher if, if you're negative and if you're on the top 
you were a little bit more conservative. But you can see we've got some retail, some uh, industrial and office, um, had a prison in there, a travel center, um, and then a church. So the, the church was a, hoping for a really large congregation, and they got a small one. All right, the, the jurisdictional interviews, um, we captured uh, qualitative contextual information for each site. Um, we had a series of, of questions that we had approved from the uh, technical advisory committee that were fairly open-ended and broad. And then at each site, we had some, <clears throat> excuse me, some specific questions to ask for clarification. Uh, our primary focus was to try to get at why the deviation. Uh, for the literature search, um, we used the internet. Uh, we looked at guidelines from uh, state DOTs, cities, and counties, and you can see the distribution of what we found out there. Um, and there were right around 60 that, that we were able to find easily online. Well, maybe not so easily. Darren can respond to that. Um, most jurisdictions either don't have a TIA online, uh, TIA gu guidelines online, or or, uh, or they don't have them at all. So one of those two, we, we don't really know the answer to that question. Um, all the guidelines use the following, uh, trip generation and trip distribution, and, and they um, have an approach to trip assignment analysis. So those were common elements. Um, there were unique elements in a few of the TIA guidelines. You'd expect that, no surprise. Uh, no individual guideline was the premier guideline. Um, all of them had features that, that were different, unique, some better than others. Um, the, IT, or the ITE trip generation manual is the main source for estimating trips. And I think maybe people use it more uh, as an absolute than as an interpretive sort of tool. Um, and there are no consistent methods uh, for the application of ITE, horizontal or horizon year, or significant impact thresholds for mitigation. So when would you add an auxiliary lane, that kind of thing? There's no rigorous uh, threshold that everybody uses. Here's a summary of all of the TIA guidelines, I guess 54 was the number that we were able to look at. Uh, ODOT's existing guidelines, how they compare to this 54. Um, ODOT's guidelines are more comprehensive and more specific than most. Uh, not included, there's a list of things here. Um, that we came across. Um, notification process, uh, different levels of analysis for the type of project. There wasn't a lot of variance there. Consistency statements adopted with local plans. You can read through this. Um, So the next phase of our study then really was to identify research topics and we worked with our technical advisory committee. We presented them the detail on the case studies and these were the topics that emerged that were, uh, had the appearance of the most benefit uh, to ODOT and local jurisdictions. Um, so to take a look at selection and application of land use code, pass by trip reduction assumptions, um, seasonal adjustments, you know, the coast, obviously there's more uh, summer peaks than winter, traffic's down a bit, except for those storm watchers. Um, the inclusion of alternative modes, so uh, what impact does a truck make versus a, a bicycle versus a pedestrian versus a car. Uh, the analysis software, um, is, is there some clues as to which ones you should be using that are, you know, the toolkit, what's in the toolkit, what's best. Um, regional demand versus uh, growth rate. So model, modeling region traffic versus assuming a growth rate. Uh, what's a better approach? 
uh, planning horizon years? Should we be out five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years? What's the appropriate year to forecast to? Uh, safety, what are the implications uh, once the development's in place? Has safety been fully con considered? Um, other topics of interest that, that popped up but we didn't spend any energy at was uh, site prediction and monitoring. Um, so that would be a way of capturing really lessons learned for the extended life of a development, maybe making some adjustments after the fact. Uh, secondary impacts, uh, effects of local versus regional development, and then level of accuracy. Those, again, those last four were dismissed. Um, I think uh, uh, this next is really kind of probe into uh, the first bullet on this slide. We'll show you an example of the materials that were provided to the Technical Advisory Committee and what would be included in the best practice. Um, the selection and application of the land use code. Um, again, eight of 12 sites were built according to the proposal in the TIA. Uh, three of four were not built as proposed. And the re remaining sites are underdeveloped from what was planned. Um, so regarding the selection and application of a land use code, we'll use this example um, of Five Oaks uh, West in Hillsborough. And um, Darren, do you want to talk through this? Sure. Okay. Um, so this, this is a, this is an example of applying a, a land use code application using different of uh, using a different ITE land use code. The example is just the the range and trip, trip trip generation that you can get between applying certain land use code. This development would actually the definitions in the ITE manual are very vague. So they don't really go into much detail. This development actually would have qualified or under any of these ITE land use codes. So this is just an example of showing how um, you can kind of fiddle with the trip generation um, to, according to what the ITE land use code is. Oh. Yeah. This, is a, this is another example. It was the Barja Crossing in Eugene. Um, the TIA used the shopping center land use code and predicted 824 trips. Um, as, as was mentioned before, there, was actually, um, there are a multiple number of land uses in the development. It wasn't only a shopping center. Include a McDonald's, a convenience store, and a gas station. So this is just an example to show how other land use codes could have been applied. So applying the, uh, the land use code for fast food, a fast food restaurant, and applying a land use code for a service station, you come up with a completely different trip generation than what was predicted. Um, and actually, the second scenario actually was a lot closer to, to what's actually occurring. Uh, so. Um, so again, retail sites can have multiple codes, land use codes that are applied. Um, So what, what we concluded from, the, from the, uh, the research was that basically no major overhauls to ODOT's uh, existing TIA requirements were necessary. Um, as was mentioned, they were pretty detailed and concise in, in what they were um, trying to get at. Um, our research showed that variables with some predict predictability in the TIAs were the level of service, daily trips, and trip distribution. And the variables with the least consistency in terms of being accurate between what was predicted and existing conditions were uh, peak hour trips um, and individual turning movements. I'll, I'll step back in here for a second, uh, Darren. The, uh, what, what's interesting is these variables that are least consistent actually don't matter as much to safety and operations as those that that are. So interesting that it would those that are most predictable 
make a difference. So the areas for additional guidance, and this is where we thought the study could add the most value, is to provide some additional detail around land use code selection and application so that people really understand which codes, how to use them, uh, and provide some examples of application. And in Darren's talk through of that example analysis is one way that you can compare. Um, also then to take a look at the truck traffic considerations and then safety evaluation of crashes. Um, you might do something differently if there was uh, an accumulation of, of accidents at a particular location near the development. So the TAC, the Technical Advisory Committee was very much interested in safety not just the operations. And then uh, circulation and modal conflicts. Um, so the best practices document, what we're, um, we're ensuring that critical transportation development issues are considered in the scoping process. So let's start with an idea in mind of what the analysis is gonna cover based on, on the proposal and the ideas of what the how the land's going to be developed. Um, provide a, a recommended best practice for how to do that to um, the preparers and reviewers. So whether that's a checklist of items to say this is in the scope. No, this is really isn't going to matter for this particular site, uh, but there needs to be a tool there to help people get it right, minimize the amount of, of redo loops uh, promote uh, increased understanding of the key issues to consider in TISs. So this is what we're hoping to uh, communicate in the best practices document. Um, this graphic here really shows how the best practices would relate to other existing tools that are out there for uh, ODOT, local uh, government jurisdictions. So you have the uh, transportation planning rule uh, it describes really the relationship of transportation and land use. That's a tool for the local government to court address in their comprehensive plan, their transportation system plan, and their development code. There's also Division 51, which covers uh, access control, uh, access spacing, road approaches, uh, use of medians, that, that kind of thing. Um, also feeding into what the local government actions would be. And then you've got the uh, development review guidelines. And again, that's one of the 54 we looked at. Um, and that would set forth the requirements. And then uh, based on those requirements, you could refer to the best practices document, which we'll be delivering to ODOT in May and ODOT intends to put on a website. We don't have that location uh, just yet, so this is real time. And uh, the best practice document would cover uh, the items shown in the bullet. And, and then from those documents, you get a traffic impact study. Um, the idea for a traffic impact study uh, process is that you would do some scoping and planning in the very beginning based on what the developer wants to do. And uh, the local jurisdiction, ODOT, and the developer would get together and collaborate over what that scope would be. And then they'd perform the study to fit that particular situation. And then they would check the analysis where the results indicate. Is there anything uh, from the initial scoped analysis that indicates we need to refine something, look at, look at a particular analysis in more detail. Um, then you would do that refinement analysis and then agree on uh, proposed mitigation and conditional uses. So the idea in the TIS scoping is to really balance the, the scope and budget with the, the content, the scale, and the complexity of the proposal. Um, only do as much analysis as fits what the development's going to be. Uh, ODOT has not developed a statewide checklist at this point. Um, and what we're going to put together a range of topics based from those other 
uh, guidelines that we've reviewed and have uh, a list of items, menu items, that they could look at uh, during scoping. So here's a long list of uh, different items for consideration. Uh, everything from proposed uses, existing uses, study limits uh, on the left-hand column, study intersections on the right-hand column to potential mitigation opportunities. So you almost have to speculate a little bit so that you make sure that your analysis is uh, going to cover uh, what's intended. Um, here we go. Darren, you're going to be back up with this particular chart. I should mention that we, uh, early on in the presentation we've referred to it as a TIA and now we're referring it to a TIS. For the, for the purposes of this project, they're the same thing. Um, the project was called Traffic Impact Analysis, but ODA actually refers to the, it as a traffic impact study in the development uh, review guidelines. So that's why now we're talking, referring to TIS rather than a TIA. So. Uh, this is an example of a page from the ITE manual. Actually, we got recommendation from the TAC not to actually call it a manual because it implies that it's accurate, and so I'll just call it trip generation. This is an example of a page from trip generation. It's, um, it just shows what's out there. The independent variable, which is um, number of employees, um, size of the proposed development, it could be a number of things. And then on the y-axis is um, the actual trip generation. And at the bottom, you have a, a regression line, which is, could be a straight line or a curve, um, and also an average rate, which is the average 50% um, higher, 50% lower um, between the data points. Um, an this, this, actual, this actual land use code only had nine studies. So there, um, one of the criticisms of the ITE uh, trip generation is that they come up with average rate and um, the regression equations with the low data set, so just pointing that out. <laughs> this is an example here of, um, from the IT manual. Um, the, the curved line is the regression model, and then the average rate's the one in the middle. And if, for instance, if you use the, uh, if your development was, for instance, the red circle, um, and you use the average rate, you would predicting all, you would be predicting a lot less trip generation than um, because you would be lower on the uh, trip gener on the y-axis, and same with the uh, regression curve. So, um, so with working with the TAC, we we came up with. Um, under certain circumstances, when to use the regression equation, when to use the average rate, and then what, when not to use the trip generation um, guide. Um, so these were um, these were what we came up with the, to, w to when to use the regression equation. Um, it's actually ITE publishes the trip generation handbook, which actually has something that's very similar to this, but the TAC recommended that we adjust it a little bit. So. This was our recommendation that's in the best practices document of when to use the rec regression equation. And then similarly, we, used, we came up with um, a methodology of when to use the weighted average rate. Um, you can see there what that is. And notice there would have to be at least three data points um, in the ITE manual. If there was one or two, the best practices um, document would recommend not using the ITE trip generation manual. So this is just a summary of a flowchart of how to select between re the regression equation and the average rate. Um, it's probably easier. I'll just easier just read it. <laughs> so I'll wait. Actually, I can't read it. Oh, you can't? Okay, sorry. Um, so, so the first point is if uh, well, I don't know if this is worthwhile going into detail, but. Um, yeah, because it gets kind of complex, so it will be available in the best practice document. It just shows that we came up with a methodology of how to use, when to use the average rate, when to use the regression equation, and in, in, in from what we've stu studied in the guidelines that we reviewed, um, there were very few jurisdictions actually gave that type of guidance. So often what was occurring in these TIA reports were 
the consultants or the developer were kind of picking the one that they liked most, and generally that was the one that um, predicted less trips. So. <laughs> So at, at the end, over on the left-hand column was when we recommended not to use a trip generation manual. Um, this is what the best practi practice document says that we came up with. Um, so then I'll, now I'll go through the, the topic, the research topics, what we researched, and then how it was applied to the best practice document. And one was future near analysis, which is the same as planning horizon. We just changed the term. Um, so at a minimum, the TISH, the TISH should address existing conditions, the opening year, future phases, and anything else requested by ODOT, depending on the situation. Safety, what we found was that a lot of the TIAs that we, or uh, the TIA guidelines that we reviewed didn't require a safety analysis to consider what's the existing conditions in terms of safety. So. Um, the best practice document says the TIS should take a proactive step to analyze specific safety elements, recommending a field study, um, and to identify safety constraints and issues. I'm just kind of giving a brief abstract of uh, the nine topics that we researched and then what we recommend in, in the best practice, practices document. A regional model versus growth rates. Um, ODOT recommends three different uh, approaches. One is a regional travel demand model, which is typically only in uh, urbanized areas with MPOs. Um, a cumulative analysis, most suitable for smaller urban areas or a portion of a large urban area and for short periods of times. And growth trends, which is typically for rural data or rural areas with stable growth rates. For truck trip generation, um, the best practices document recommends um, citing the existing truck, the, the existing percentage of trucks. Um, more complex studies should assess truck safety and operations, and the mo and the more and the most complex projects should assess truck distribution. Transit analysis: this was missing in a lot of the TIA guidelines that we reviewed. Um, because the ITE data is generally was developed from sites that are mostly automobile oriented, uh, the basic recommendation was if there is significant um, alternative modes, um, if the mode split was not significantly, um, what am I trying to say? If the <laughs> if the mo if if the site wasn't dominantly um, accessed by car. Then we, then we recommend using a different source other than the ITE manual because the ITE manual, a lot of the data um, came from sites where the automobile was the primary um, um, mode to access the site. Uh, for bicycle and pedestrian analysis, um, again, this was something that wasn't considered because these reports generally just look at the impacts of traffic rather than other modes. Um, so the recommendation was to identify existing and planned bicycle and pedestrian facilities, maintain or improve existing conditions, and identify the facilities that will be affected by the proposed development. Um, design hour volumes and seasonal factors. Um, ODA actually requires this to be done for the traffic counts um, to apply a seasonal factor for it. And it, the, the, when we were reviewing these, we actually found that a lot of the TIAs didn't actually document that. So we kind of just assumed that they did, but it wasn't actually known. So the recommendation was this, was ODOT already requires this, so continue to do it. But you, you need to document it in the TIH so it was known that it was actually done. And pass by trip reductions. Um, pass by trips are trips that are um, are already on the network and they aren't generated generated by the development. For instance, the, for instance, the gas station person may be driving by and they decide to get gas. That gas or that trip wasn't actually uh, generated by that development. The 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 vehicle was already on the network. So uh, what we found the trip generation handbook actually has um, pass by trip data percentages, um, but the but the range was 
typically about 50%. So for some land uses, they, they had data that was, you know, apply a 20% pacify trip reduction, uh, but other data show 80% trip reduction. So basically the conclusion was not to use that because of the large range in, um, in um, the trip reduction um, percentage. Trip, trip generation, um, again, we did not recommend using the chip generation handbook um, because the, the data was very limited and it didn't really have, um, uh, there wasn't a significant amount of data. And that's it. Yeah. So I, I guess if your 54 case studies that you had or the 54? There were studies 12 there. case studies, okay, and, and we reviewed 54 traffic impact analysis guidelines. Guidelines, okay. So of, of the case studies then, how, how often would one want to use the ITE manual? Uh, it seems like you wouldn't want to use it very often at all. Um, well, it is the only main source out there. So it will continue to be used, but basically, um, the purpose of this document was to set up a methodology to say when to use it and when not to use it. So in most cases, it will still continue to be used. But if, um, for instance, the land use code that's being used only has a, one or two data points, um, then they need to find a different method. Um, but you know, a lot of people use the IT trip generation manual because it's, it's easy, easy to use. But other developers will um, maybe come up with their own um, you know, maybe sample a similar development, come up with their own trip rate. But so, so I mean, it was still it will still be used a lot. But we set up a methodology of when to use it and when not. I I'd use an analogy to answer the question. When I was in college, I worked for a guy who owned a furniture store. We would get these tables in, and you'd have to screw the tables or screw the legs into the table. When it got too hard to turn, he'd take a hammer and hit it in the rest of the way. So you have two tools to use. One of them was the right way to, right tool to use. <laughs> One was the wrong tool to use. And so within the ITE manual, there are two different methods you can use. One of them is appropriate. Perhaps neither the screwdriver nor the hammer are appropriate for the particular development. So you have to use a different tool. So the best practice is, is an attempt to show you when to use what tool. Question. For the case study locations, it didn't look like you had any Portland, City of Portland uh, case studies, and was that a, uh, on purpose? The, the case studies were actually a, a box of TI uh, traffic impact studies that were provided to us by our, our, uh, our technical advisory committee. So the local jurisdictions as well as ODOT uh, pulled together, I think there's maybe 25 or 30, and we sorted through to see which ones actually met the criteria. Uh, and so we picked all of them that did. And there were some Portland traffic impact studies in there that uh, for one reason or another uh, didn't fit. And it, none of them were uh, eliminated on the basis of our firm having a conflict of interest. So it had to do with the criteria. Yeah, mostly they were uh, eliminated because of the number of access points. In order to get the existing trip generation, we had to hire a, a traffic counter to go out there and get traffic counts. And usually the ones that were eliminated had too many access points. It would have been too expensive to uh, see what the existing trip generation would be. So that was one of the um, criteria that the TAC came up with. That's why some were eliminated. And, and if you wanted to to use the, the case studies, uh, some of the uh, developments in Eugene would be similar to the Portland area. So there's still a crossover um, when you get to that point when it's online and available for your use. Those are the ones that I would look to. Other questions? Right here. Um, when you were looking into uh, growth pattern and land use um, impacts, did you look into the adjacent jurisdictions, or were your studies focusing mainly on the patterns within that jurisdiction, like within the, the city boundary or the county? What if you had an area that was pretty close to two counties, one with a high growth rate and one with a lower? 
I, be I believe that was part of the criteria that had to be, it couldn't border another jurisdiction. So we only did, um, when we had these interviews, we only contacted or interviewed the jurisdiction where the development was located. So in, in all the case studies, you know, there wasn't a, um, a nearby jurisdiction it was within the county or within the city, not bordering another county or city. Is that what you were asking? Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's my question, I guess. Maybe, was that one of the reasons maybe why you didn't select a site, say, in the Portland area because of, you know, the Tri-County? <coughs> we have three counties, yeah. and maybe that was one of the reasons. Well, there was one site in the Portland area. It was on along 82nd, um, so it is it is in Portland. Or no, it was in, actually, I'm sorry, it's just outside of the city of Portland. It's in Clackamas County. Um, um, so I don't know if that, was that a criteria? Or? Yep. It had more to do with the the site configuration rather than where the jurisdictional boundaries were. There's another question. How did you decide to do this project? Was this something that CH2M Hill asked you to do, or did you guys suggest this to CH2M Hill? Um, we work for CH2M Hill. ODOT is our client, and and ODOT asked us to perform this project. Wasn't it a federal grant, or? And and they did get federal funding for this particular project. Tom Boyat, who was on our technical advisory committee, actually <coughs> filled out the paperwork for this to be a research project. Question in the far back. Yeah. Will this lead to any recommendations recommendations for developers? Thank you. Um, as far as. Uh, when they're choosing a site to do a development, they're out looking for sites, they're going to invest a lot of time and money into a specific site. Is there going to be any recommendations where they should be looking um, ahead of time before they start tying up that money, before they start doing their due diligence or for actually choosing a site? Will this lead to any recommendations like that? No, this is downstream of that. Um, we're not attempting to guide developers as to where they should be developing. Developers probably know that better than we do. What this really was aimed at is once a developer has selected a site for a variety of reasons and, and they want to proceed with that development, one of the things they have to do is analyze the traffic impacts. So this research project is focused around how that can be done efficiently and effectively. Okay, so it, I, I know from my experience that developers can be a little frustrated at how much it costs to do a traffic impact study. So that's one of the things we wanted to help was make this a clear uh, streamlined process for defining the size and the scale of that to fit the actual development. So we're more trying to fit the analysis to what the developer wants to do as opposed to telling the developer what they ought to do. Another question right there. Uh, for the Berger crossing, was the reason their PM peak projection was so far off by for not using the multi, multi the different uses that were at that site and just focusing on the shopping center? Uh, when we when we interviewed the person, that was their speculation. The the person at the city of Eugene, um, that was his speculation that they probably should have used different IT land use codes, but and we don't know for sure. And then for the other, were there one or two other case examples that got a grade of D? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? For the other case examples, or is there another one or two of them that got a grade of D overall? And what was the reason for their? to go back and check. It's pretty small here. <laughs> I can read it. Okay, one, yeah, one was, uh, there were two with Ds. One was the Costco in Medford. Um, the reason with that was because of, it, this is on the Crater Lake Highway, um, you know, up in Northeast Medford. That's, there's a lot of big box retail development around there now. Um, the, this Costco was one of the first ones to go in, and the TIA didn't um, 
well, this was the city of Medford's interpretation. They didn't adequately, adequately um, pr predict the, the amount of retail development that would occur in the future in that area. Because right now, next to the Costco, there's a Walmart. Um, down the street, there's a, either a Lowe's or a Home Depot. Or Have you so. been on the Crater Lake Highway in Medford? Yeah, between Medford and White City, Costco was one of the earlier developments out there, and it's just exploded out there. There's a lot of development, and so I think, uh, you know, that some of those synergistic effects. You know, the you get one development out there, and blink, two or three or four or three dozen show up. Another issue with that site was um, a gas station, a Costco gas station, a fueling facility was put in about three or four years after the Costco was built. And be, the way the city of Medford's code is written is, is that they didn't actually need a um, traffic impact study to put that in. So obviously that also affected the, the number of trips in that area too. We did try to factor that out when, when comparing the TIA to the existing conditions, but um, that probably had some influence on it. Another question here. Then. Did you uh, consider in future growth in a community where, say, a company is new to the area, so they're building one st store, but five years down the road they're going to build another. So people from that entire community won't have to go to the one store. We'll start going to one that's closer, so that might reduce the number of, or the amount of traffic going to that original store. We, we actually looked at this, in the, in the case study analysis, our approach was to look at that individual report and development and, and not necessarily consider actions that would occur 10 years down the line. We did not consider that. Does that satisfy you? Well, I was just not thinking maybe 10 years, but five or two years. Yeah. It, if it was communicated in the traffic impact study, then we could, we could look at it. But how many do? Usually they don't talk about, we're going to do another development five miles away. I guess my question just comes from uh, uh, things I've heard kind of through work and elsewhere just that the IT trip generation manual has a tendency to overestimate trips because the studies were done like in California or Arizona in the southeast or southwest. And so my question really is about your definition of accurate and your definition of conservative because when I add up the B's and C's there, I'm seeing 7 out of 12 as being accurate or conservative. And I'm wondering through your findings if if you feel that the TIA findings may have led uh, to development requirements that may not have been needed in the end, which would cost money, add pavement, um, and maybe um, uh, lead to additional kind of induced growth down the line. Um, I appreciate the question. You know, that's, that's part of making good decisions one of the, the things that, that concerned me early on was overbuilding. You know, that's, that's an expense to the developer uh, and it creates an expense for the jurisdiction downstream because they've got to build everything to match to that if there's induced growth related to that. Uh, Darren, do you recall in looking through those case studies uh, was <coughs> Did the conservatism uh, actually lead to the construction of additional capacity beyond or earlier than that capacity was needed? <laughs> Not from what I recall, because of the because of, in my opinion, because a lot of the developments were in already urbanized areas, um, the infrastructure was already there, so they required smaller mitigation improvements. Does that, would that make sense? Yeah. As opposed to building a whole new roadway or a yeah. uh, new interchange, or but I mean, the, <laughs> in analyses that I've done before, personally, I didn't do any of these. But um, the practice you use is you look at the existing facilities of what's there, and in some cases, it's it, it to balance it out. It's kind of self-metering. 
because only so many trips can get there. So if you're predicting a huge amount, you only need to go so far because only so many people can get there. So that moderating effect has, it, it, it happens on a development. Um, on the other hand, local jurisdictions to allow for future development on the facilities where eventually the demand will get there, they can condition the improvements into future years and they can uh, collect money from the developer and put it in escrow until it's until that improvement is required. So there are different ways to address that issue rather than day one, build it all. You talked about the importance of making good decisions. Did you review the criteria of the people who did the analysis for the 12 uh, sites you reviewed and will your manual make recommendations on the uh, qualifications of people doing these reports in the future? The, uh, the best practices is really going to address kind of the, st the, the points that needed additional detail. If it's about requirements and, that, and, and who should actually be doing the evaluation, we didn't really evaluate that one way or the other. That would fall back to the jurisdiction to refine their requirements. So we stayed on the best practice side of it rather than the regulatory side of what the requirements. Does that make sense what I'm saying? If, if ODOT wanted, for example, if ODOT only wanted traffic engineers with 15 years experience, then they would have to say that in their, gui in their traffic impact study guidelines. And I'm using a hyperbole here, you know. That 15 years, that's a lot of experience. Um, traffic impact studies can be done successfully with far less experience. So we didn't get into that. that we could have got into organizational <laughs> issues, Perhaps um, one of the thoughts early on was was maybe the local jurisdiction or ODOT should partner up and select, uh, based on qualifications, traffic engineers and force a developer to hire one of those. Well, there wasn't much appetite to go there with that kind of a solution. Okay? So... Just had a quick question about the ITE data. Uh, our students have been working on several projects over the last few years to go out and collect data that then will be incorporated into the next ITE trip generation update. And ITE is funding some of that effort. Um, was there any evidence that anyone had actually done any uh, primary data collection to reinforce or improve the what they pulled out of ITE? This is a Darren question. Um, they all use ITE. There were some that gathered additional data where needed so at certain intersections or certain access points, but it wasn't a comprehensive analysis. It was more intersection. The trip generation data was, did, did anyone go out and collect their own trip generation oh. data? No. It was all, uh, they all used the, trip gen the ITE manual. Rob, it's interesting. I've, I've done a couple of traffic impact studies where we did do our own for that particular site. I haven't been to this side of the room. I'll come back and get you um, next. Okay. See if I can get this straight in my head. Um, you said that ODOT does not include neighborhood through traffic uh, research in its TIAs. Is that, do I understand that correctly? And if, in, but you said that some of the cities you looked at do include that. Is there a reason why you guys didn't recommend that or aren't? Well, the ones that, that did were, were cities and they were mostly, see ODOT's generally only concerned about their facilities, which makes sense. Um, but the, the ones that recommend, or there were only a two, couple of jurisdictions, one was Palo Alto, California, that had the neighborhood as impact assessment. And that's because they wanted to see if there would be an impact on their other facilities. Um, especially that are low arterial or, or uh, you know, neighborhood streets. Um, so, when you, you know, it, in my opinion, that 
issue doesn't become a major issue in Oregon because of the level of transportation system planning and the approach to that that's done. Um, it, it, there is an evaluation of form and function of the network and a particular development would it spark additional cut through traffic? Perhaps, but that would be something that could come up in the refinement stage of, of a traffic impact analysis. So if your results from the, the analysis say, you know, hey guys, we're, we're really seeing a lot of people would, would use this side road and they might turn left instead of right back onto the arterial. That would be an opportunity from a sta uh, process standpoint to address that issue. But as, as far as a process and a procedure, that would rank fairly low on the priority list from, from our analysis. And right here. Uh, it seems like there's not very much data in ITE, and it's seen uh, several exa examples of retail I've been involved with or heard about. There was opposition to it, so the store, the company, Walmart or Coastal Farm or whoever, said, oh, okay, we'll answer this question. We'll count, we'll do a count at our store that's just like it in the, somewhere else. And is there any practice of putting that data into the IT. I mean, it seems like that happens often, from time to time. Uh, that gets back to uh, kind of different methods used for trip generation using a comparable site. Um, we're certainly not in a position to recommend to ITE to, to include that kind of data. It could be probably forwarded to the group of folks. Jennifer, Rob, you guys have any insight as to how that data might get incorporated? You're the volunteer process that people who have studies that they uh, submit to ITE and that are included. So there's no kind of a professional responsibility of traffic engineers to contribute their results to the to the document that's used. Hmm. We got an answer. Thank you. It's another question. I believe it's accurate to say that Metro is doing a significant amount of traffic modeling, traffic flow modeling in conjunction with their urban growth boundary expansion studies here in the Portland metropolitan area. How does your work fit in, if it does, with the work that they're trying to do? Um, that's a good question. I'd have to get back to you on that if I knew more about the, the Metro work. Darren, do you know about the Metro work? I don't know if I, I can't. I, <laughs> so I the can answer touch to base with you after the meeting. Okay, great. I can do that. I have a question from a web viewer uh, who emailed in, and I'm going to sort of expand a little bit. He was asking about sort of the time horizon because you had mentioned, you know, should we be looking five years, ten years, fifteen years, whatever? And he was wondering sort of how accurate you can be at different time frames. And I noticed in your recommendations. You didn't have, I don't think, a very specific recommendation. It was more like do whatever ODOT tells you uh, or the jurisdiction. And I'm wondering, did you debate actual, you know, 10 years or 5 years or, and then just figure you can't come up with that? Or if you could just expand a bit about the time horizon. Yeah. Well, go ahead. <laughs> ODOT actually does recommend um, in their development review guidelines, I believe it's, it's in one of their documents, uh, a timing frame depending on the trip generation of the proposed development, how far out you have to look. Um, so the, they actually do recommend that we include that in the best practices, but there was a stipulation that said, you know, you can change that with ODOT's approval, et cetera. So um, does that partly answer? Well, so is what you're saying that there's some land uses that they say, okay, well, you can predict this for five years, but you can predict this for 10 years? or? Are right. You, Depends on. Say like retail, do it out for X years. Well, it's actually more dependent on p the PM trip generation or a peak hour trip generation or um, a zoning change. Those were the two main things. It wasn't really land use specific. So, right. Yeah, it's interesting. Where we ended up focusing were on topics that uh, the technical advisory committee had uh, some uncertainty about or um, 
maybe some misgivings about where it was going. Other places where they were uh, pretty confident in how it was working and whether it was working adequately for them, uh, we didn't go into as much detail. So that's really how we, u- we use the Technical Advisory Committee as a steering team to focus our effort. And uh, when it came to Horizon years, they feel like the system's working pretty well and that uh, that's an item that should be negotiated between the developer and the local jurisdiction in ODOT uh, at the time of scoping. If there are other projects, all of that comes into play as to what that year should be. And uh, um, the sense is that that discussion works pretty well. So we actually have another web question that I was uh, had to read, so I think I understand it. Um, so when a development is, is, you know, when you're doing a traffic impact study, they have to assume what they make some assumptions about what future development is going to be, what other projects, whatever. And then if the developer is then having to pay for some of the improvement costs, some of the mitigation, how do you deal with the future, those other developments that they assume are going in, how do you account for them paying in the future? How do you div- div- divvy up the cost? Maybe. Yeah, the, the, the uh, financial obligations and commitments of the variety of developer developments, that really wasn't part of the scope of what we were looking at. Uh, again, that's uh, kind of the financial responsibility. We were focused more on the technical elements of doing the traffic impact analysis. Just ba- based on your sort of work in the field, uh, separate from this study, is it usually that a developer would only be made to pay a portion of the cost that's assumed yeah. to be the portion that they're contributing? Yeah. Actually, case law guides and instructs ODOT and local governments how to assign fiscal responsibility. Of the members of your uh, technical advisory committee, how many of them have actually prepared a uh, traffic impact study? Prepared? I don't know, but, there, but all of them were reviewers of them. Um, you would know better, Jay. And that's why they were on the TAC, because they actually reviewed them for their jurisdiction. Yeah, four of the technical advisory committees have actually prepared them themselves as well as, as all of them have reviewed them, except uh, the FHWA folks. Their participation had to do with, are we getting a good investment for our research dollar? <laughs> I didn't know that. Other questions? Uh, without further questions, before we thank our speakers, I will remind uh, people about next week's seminar. We have um, Kevin Chang from King County Department of Transportation talk, uh, talking about neighborhood traffic calming from investigation to implementation. Um, but first, uh, we definitely want to thank our speakers for coming today. and everyone for Thank you.